G'day everyone and welcome to my art channel Brushes with Beck. I know it has been quite some time since my last video but here I am with a, another dog portrait for you. This is a pet portrait I was commissioned. On the left here you can see I have my colour chart that I have mapped out for this particular dog, my colour selection and then the um, sketch of the dog on the right on white pastel matte paper. Now this dog is a Hungarian Pumi breed which is a breed I hadn't heard of before, but it's quite interesting to draw, quite curly hair, quite dense hair. So that was really interesting for me and a really new challenge for me. So we'll get into the details of that in a little bit. First off, I just want to apologize for my absence for quite some time from YouTube. It's been a very busy second half of the year for us. We had to move house and that was a whole big thing. But finally, I have had time to make some more art again. I've had time to do my actual video editing. This video was almost completely edited. I just hadn't recorded the audio for it. So that's why it hadn't been uploaded yet because I finished this portrait months and months ago. So working on this ear here, you can see what I've done is I've mapped in light and dark areas first. Now the beautiful thing about pastel matte is you can lay in lights quite easily over dark areas. So I've mapped in the shadows of the larger portions of hairs, like I've mapped in those lighter areas and darker areas that are hidden behind. And once I've sort of laid in those base colors, then I'm working in lots of detail with all of those individual hairs. So the really important part for me here was to make sure I was mapping in those under layers correctly and then those all those little individual hairs don't need to be precise but they need to be sort of the right color and they need to look the right sort of um, like the right kind of hair you don't want a smooth looking hair so as I was doing those little strands of hair, I was rolling my pencil to get those little wavy bits in the hair. Now from there, because I like to work left to right on my portraits, because I am right handed, I moved on to the neck of the dog. Now the neck of the dog in my reference photo, which I don't have up on this video today because it is not my photo to share with you guys. I was just given permission to use it for this portrait. Um, so I've the neck of the, the dog in this photo is quite blurry like there is a strong focus on the dog's face so while I needed to make sure I still had a fair amount of detail in here I also needed to make it a little bit softer than the face itself so that I could make sure that the focus was really drawn to that face so the neck was a little bit more complex because there was seemed to be fur just going every which way and I sort of really had to focus in on getting those patterns of light and dark correct to get that fur depth looking accurate. Moving on to the collar, this is something that I really, really enjoyed. I loved getting that fabric texture across the strap of the collar there in the blues. That was really, really nice to do because I was able to lay in some really fine lines with the darker blue over the top of that lighter blue and get that picked up by the pastel mat just gently to suggest the texture of the fabric there. Now pastel matte is great though because of course you can also get really smooth textures which is what I needed for this buckle as well. So that is probably there's so many things I love about pastel matte. I've ranted about it before in other videos but it's great for smooth texture, it's great for textured texture and you know light over dark absolutely exceptional sort of paper. So I, this portrait really was a big challenge for me because I hadn't done a curly haired dog before. And in addition to that, doing a collar is not something I normally do. I've done a couple before, but in terms of things that I normally draw, collars are not one of them. I'm normally drawing fur or feathers or something along those lines. So to achieve different textures that, that I need to achieve, different materials, is always a new fun challenge for me. And I really enjoy being able to work through that uh, pro and problem solve really as I do a piece like this. So just working through more of the color, we've got a buckle here. Now I've put some, it looks like a yellow ochre or a similar color down. I'm sorry, I don't remember what colors I've used uh, because this portrait, as I said, was months ago and I thought I had the audio recorded for it and I just needed to edit it together, but I couldn't find an audio recording. So here I am recording an audio for a portrait that I finished months and months ago. 
but I'm, I used some sort of a yellow on the buckle there because part of the reflection on that silver buckle was had quite a yellow tone so that really helps make that a bit more realistic that it's not just greys it is reflecting things around it as metal tends to do so obviously the lower part of the neck here and once again mapping in shadow areas lighter areas and just getting myself sort of oriented in terms of where my fur is going to be going which direction it's going to be going in and as you can see i'm softening all that up with a cotton bud and i do get this question a lot when i use a cotton bud to blend out i'm always using it dry there is no um, water there is no uh, mineral spirits or anything on my cotton bud i just use it dry it blends really nicely on pastel mat and softens things up quite nicely sometimes it picks up a bit of color and you have to lay more color back down to strengthen it up but it does help you get a nice soft underlayer if you need it or to soften up any sort of details or blend things together now as you can see i've got that in and moving on to the next area now you can see um, i'm using some uh, different colors in my fur here i'm not just going in with grays there are some very subtle color tones in here i think on the ear i had like a light purple and then through here i've got very pale blue as well just because there are some very subtle colors coming through in this fur i've got a little bit of i think it's caput morton violet in the shadowed areas and just real hints really subtle hints of color that just help to make this dog pop a little bit more than it would if it was just plain old gray so if you see me using some bright colors in here that's why you can see there's a little bit of that purplish and caput mortem tinge to the ear there that i've already completed moving on to the face was a little bit easier the fur is not as curly it has more of a direction to it but i'm still using a little bit of a twist to the pencil when i do the fur strands so that i'm making sure that that fur does look a little bit curly wiry as opposed to just straight and smooth now they're not especially wiry they're not like a coarse wiry fur but they have that little bit of curl to the fur strands so you need to make sure you capture that when you draw a dog like this otherwise the fur texture just doesn't look correct so moving through the face there you can see like i said i've added in some blues there and there's a little bit of a yellowish tone around the eye as well so it's really important to make sure you look at those subtle colors in your reference photos if you can't see those colors you can go into a program such as photoshop and change the saturation of the photo um, don't save it like that just you can play around with the saturation push it all the way to one side if you need to just to see what colors are in there it may, might reveal some blues or greens or reds and then once you know what colors are in there you can bring the saturation back down to normal for your drawing but at least you know there are some of those subtle colors in your drawing now here i'm just finishing up that first eye eyes are really lovely to do on pastel mat really easy the detail I mean some people find the detail a little bit tricky but if you've got a sharp enough pencil the details no problem but you can see there's a beautiful blend there on the eye and it's easy to get those highlights in where they need to be and you get this really beautiful glassy looking eye um, even on pastel mat you don't need a smooth paper to get a nice glassy looking eye where that looks realistic once the eye is in i feel more confident that i can complete the fur and the texture around the eye i could move in there and start adding that in now i also find with the blending out with a cotton bud on pastel mat and building up lots of layers because the paper has that little bit of texture to it you can also get you can kind of almost get like this little three-dimensional appearance of your drawing so your under layers sort of sit lower down in the paper and then when you pop these little fine hairs in over the top they tend to be caught just on that top surface of the texture and it looks like they are sitting further in front not just because of the way you've illustrated it but because of the paper texture itself the uh, if you draw lightly over the top and you're just capturing the top of that texture the drawing itself is sitting slightly further forward than the underlayers that you've done so it's actually quite fascinating to look at um, if you've used this paper in person you can sort of just see there's that subtle change in and it almost you know it gives it that extra pop i feel that's just me personally as opposed to just flat papers but i mean 
both are wonderful for color pencil drawings but pastel mat pastel mat i do find quite fascinating to use and that's just one of the reasons why so moving on to map in some of these underlayers in the dog's uh, little chin here i found i had to move on to the chin before doing the the side of the muzzle there because some of the hairs from the side of the muzzle overlap the chin so i need to do the chin first so once i do the side of the muzzle i can then lay those hairs down over the top of the completed chin so that's something that's important to remember where your hairs overlap each other you need to make sure you're doing the stuff behind first if you're working on a paper like this if you're working on like a smooth paper you're not going to be able to work light over dark and if you've got those light hairs you need to be getting them in first and then work around them if they're behind so as you can see, I'm adding in some quite strong color here, a little bit of discoloration on some of the hairs around the muzzle. And that's pretty normal for some of these breeds with the longer hair. They tend to have that discoloration or staining around the eyes or mouth from discharge or saliva. It's just something that happens to the fur, adds a bit of character to the dog, makes them more uh, real and alive, I suppose, rather than having perfect fur. And you know, most dogs, unless they're those premium show dogs that are cleaned all the time and you know you're not going to have those stain free faces so on the side of the face here and the muzzle you can see i've got some of those yellowish ochre tones in there that's just adding some warmth to this side of the muzzle there are as i said there's a lot of different color tones through here and just making sure i get some of those in really helps ensure that this dog looks as realistic as possible and not too flat because if i just use gray tones he would look very very flat so just making sure that i get lots and lots of fur detail in there making sure i'm paying attention to the fur direction as well that's really really important because you really just need to make sure that everything flows the way it's supposed to flow if the fur's facing the wrong way it's not going to look right so just finishing up some little details around the muzzle there before we move on to the bridge of the nose. That's quite a sort of a soft little area and over the top of the forehead there as well. Now I find this area especially is really crucial when it comes to fur direction. On the bridge of the nose there, uh, in between the eyes, there's that area of fur that changes direction. So it tends to be facing the fur tends to face down towards the nose but also out towards the cheeks down to the sides and but then also it turns to turn up towards the forehead so it's a really complex area in that forehead area bridge of the nose to get that fur direction correct now obviously i've moved over to reshadowing this area by the ear because i felt that needed some work but this area by the bridge of the nose, as I said, is really, really crucial for making sure you get that accurate fur direction. It can be really tricky to get right if your reference photo is not very good because often it's not very clear. It can be hard to see that area and exactly what the fur is doing. But if you get a good reference photo, it makes it so, so easy to do. So I'm just going to make sure I get that in correctly as per the rest of the drawing, mapping in my shadowy and lighter areas these little clumpy bits of fur just mapping those in first and getting in some color underneath before i lay in my fur strands over the top and that's the really crucial part of getting sort of a three-dimensional look to the fur is making sure at least on pastel mat is making sure you've got that depth of color behind first before you lay the hair strands in over the top so there's really it's, you know, it's, it's an involved process. It's not a complicated process once you've had a lot of practice at it. It's just following the steps to get that depth of fur in, making sure you're going through that process with every area of the coat to make sure that, you know, it looks deep and alive and you can sink your hand into it sort of thing. Now on this side of the muzzle, obviously I'm going in a lot darker. I've gone in with a warm gray instead of a cool gray. There is actually quite a bit of warm gray through the piece to add some variance in color tone and not to make it all one gray. So moving on through the nose as well, I just want to get that in before I finish off that side of the muzzle. With the noses, I find them really, really fun to do. I map in, as with many other places, I map in sort of areas of light and dark color. I don't go really dark 
you know, full strength straight away because I want to make sure I get those subtle shadings and highlights correct. There's a lot more to a nose than you might think if you haven't ever looked at one closely before. Because even on the crease of the nose there, in the middle, there is a slight highlight on the rim before the nose curves in towards that crease. And it's really important to get that because it really helps shape the nose and make it look three dimensional. So you can't go too dark too fast on a nose because you need to make sure you get all those little subtle curves and highlights and reflections of light on the nose pad. And, and make sure you get those blacks nice and deep. Now, again, once again, noses are one of those things that can be really, really difficult. If your reference photo isn't very good, often the nose isn't very well lit and it's hard to see where the nostrils are or one part of the nose starts and another ends. And they can be really complicated if you don't have a good reference photo and it's just the nature of the beast, unfortunately. But the more you practice drawing noses, the better you'll get at them and the easier it will make it to um, put in inferred detail from your experience of drawing other noses if you don't have a very good reference photo. Now onto the side of the muzzle that's quite a bit darker. Uh, darker underlayer, darker grey tones, really getting in that shadowed side of the face there to make it um, really quite distinct that the light's coming from that same direction. And moving up to do that second eye, mapping that in, laying that in, getting that all filled in and beautiful before I finish up the fur. So putting in eyes is really, really satisfying. I know a lot of people like to start the eyes first. They pop the eye in, it gives them a sense of the darkest values in the piece, that black around the eye rim. And that's great. This, people can start, you know, start wherever you feel most comfortable starting on your piece. I have simply always worked left to right as a means of avoiding smudging with my hand. So for me, putting an eye in early isn't important. Once I get close to that eye, I might put it in a little bit earlier than the left to right process, but I'm not going to put it in first because I know it's going to get in the way and I'm going to risk uh, damaging that eye if I put it in. Now, obviously I always lay protective paper over the top uh, to protect from smudges, but you never know what might happen. Now with this second ear, you can see I've started in really, really messy and don't worry about that. It's not a problem at all. I've obviously gotten a bit more confident with uh, my abilities because definitely starting more messy than I did with the first ear. But like I said, it's not a problem because I'm going to be refining all these details, putting in all those hair strands over the top and fixing that up. So there's going to be plenty of detail going in over the top of those roughed, mapped in um, dark and sh um, shadow and highlight areas. As you can see, just throwing in all those hair strands now. Now this ear is also a bit more out of focus than the other ear because it's set further back in the image. And the focus, as I said earlier, is really strongly on the dog's face and eyes. So this ear wasn't as focused, not as precise. Still getting lots of those beautiful little wriggly fur strands in, rolling my pencil to get those. And it's come up really beautiful, really great texture in that ear. So now that the portrait is essentially complete, I have all of the aspects of it done. The nose, the eyes, the ears, all the fur. Uh, now I just go back through, I sort of tend to step back from it a bit and look at it and go, okay, what looks unbalanced? What do I need to fix? Am I missing any details anywhere, like any whiskers or anything? Um, do I need to correct any shadows or highlights, make anything brighter or darker? And I just go through the piece that way refine it, I look at certain areas of my reference photo and compare them, um, you know, a bit more focus. It's much, it can be much easier to compare once you've completed the piece as a whole and then you can assess as a side-by-side -side comparison rather than just being that singular focus of when I'm drawing. I tend to get really focused on the area I'm drawing and I focus on that area at a time and I move around the piece focusing on a specific area. And then at the end, I haven't really looked at the whole thing until I finished and I step back. So that's really important. So I do hope you've enjoyed this video and I do hope you enjoy the dog portrait. Uh, thank you very much for watching. If you've enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up, comment down below, subscribe to my channel, and I'll see you again next time for another one. Stay creative.